do not be alarmed. These are only a few notes to keep me on course. I know David has spoken about spiritual gifts, but uh, I want to be an encouragement this morning. I was brought up in a household where every mistake was pointed out with due care and attention, even my homework. It was the same at school. But having taught for many years from their faces smiling, I would say there are a few things we need to work on to make it even better. And they would listen. And they would take note. I think the reason was is they trusted me because I had their best interests in, at heart. And I believe that all of us need encouragement. There are those who, when they are discouraged, give up. There are those who, when they are discouraged, begin to lose heart over a period of time and abandon their work. But most of us, a little pr bit of praise goes down a great deal, doesn't it? Because then you feel confident that the person who's informing you has your interests at heart and is not looking at the work as a piece of art in its own right, but actually has a regard for the person who's producing the work. Not everyone understands that. But I found that when I treated my students with respect, they went away and they did their very best. And in fact, one said to me, actually, sir, you passed my examinations for me. Examinations. Who's ever failed an examination here? Hmm. I failed only a few times. But I tell you something, when I got to university, I never failed once. I had those teachers who never encouraged, and my father was one of them. He was my schoolmaster. He wanted me to be the best. I tell you something, the Lord Jesus, when he looks at you, thinks, I gave my life for you, I have invested my interest in you, and I want the best for you, and I want the best from you. So these are the readings. I'm going to read them with a few comments. I'm going to try and tickle your fancy, if that's possible, to encourage you to do something. In John 15, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide so that whatever you ask in my name, he may give it you. What a promise. This I command you, to love one another. I'm going to encourage you that the words of Jesus stand forever true. You see, when he chose you and appointed you that you go and bear fruit, he has an invested interest. We talk about investments, don't we? We see television adverts, commercials, all wanting your money, which they can make work for themselves first, and if there's some left over, they'll give you a little bit of interest in return. God has invested his life in you and his trust is that you will give him some return. Fruit. Which reminds me, we have a market garden place not far from where we live 
about 200 metres down the road and round the corner. And about 20 odd years ago, I went at the end of the season, I had 10 pounds in my pocket. We have quite a large garden, probably about a third of an acre in all. And I wanted some fruit trees for an orchard. So I looked at these scraggy trees at the end of the season, not very well watered, they looked awful. I said, how much do these normally go for? Ten pound each. Now, I know the owner quite well because he used to court the lady that lived next door to me. So I, I knew Brian very well. So I looked at him and shook my head. He said, all right, it's end of season. Now about a pound each. I said, done. Out of the trees, six have survived. One is very bountiful with cooking apples. One produces very large eating apples. They're red, they're perfect. Two other trees produce little apples, which are nice and sweet, which we use to feed some of our birds. We keep two little bantams and a pheasant but they like little apples. One was a plum tree. That's very productive. The other one was a Victoria plum, as against a damson kind. That's very productive. And all together, I think I had a bargain. But they needed looking after. They needed a feed every so often. Are you feeding on the word of God? Because God has invested his life in you and every word of God proves true. And when Jesus was in, in agony, being tempted of the devil, said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And then Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit after his temptation and started his public ministry. Let me encourage you to read the Word of God. How long doesn't matter. But to get something for yourself that will feed your faith, that you may fight the good fight of faith, that you may be faithful. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. Every word of God proves true. The troubles with the fruit of the Spirit is that you have to be tested in them to prove whether you are faithful and loving and kind and patient and <coughs> gentle and have self-control. We live in a world that's very disturbed. We're going to be tested on every kind, in every way. And this is what Paul wrote to Timothy. But as for you, man of God, Aim at righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. And again, how did Timothy start? You were acquainted from your childhood with the sacred writings which are able to instruct you for salvation through faith. I know there are many books on the market and there are many, many versions of the Bible. If you can find a version that suits you, that's good. I have no problem with the versions. And if you look at the index, you'll find that they all have a copyright. You know, making Bibles and printing them is one of the biggest book-selling techniques of this modern age. The motivation I'm sure, is, I'm sure is good. 
but choose a version which you find user-friendly and use it. The NIV it was called the nearly infallible version. I call it the nearly improved version. The fact is, there are so many versions that you can get, you could spend pounds on buying a book of every version. But stay with the one that's familiar, the one that you find easy to remember. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a workman who has no need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. My encouragement this morning is to find some time, which is ever, whichever is convenient to you, to read the word of God. When I was in between sort of schools and colleges and whatever, I worked in a factory. And our job was to bind up all the wool that we had brought in from, from the sheep that had been shaven and put it into great containers and squeeze them together so it was compact, put it in a large sack and sew the top on for sale. The only time in the day that I had was my tea break. That is when I read the Bible, in my tea break. Occasionally some of the men would come, ah, he's reading his Bible. Did they laugh? No. But I was content with that, because I worked with them as best I could, they began to have respect for someone who was so conscientious that actually worked with them, treated them with some honour, and was user-friendly. It was even better, actually, because uh, when I went to the boss, he offered me five shillings an hour. I said, come off it. I said, I'm quite well qualified. I think I deserve a little better than that. When I was teaching, I was learning much more an hour than that. <coughs> a little bit of leeway. He said, Ooh, I'll give you 10 shillings. I said, done. Within a week, he'd been watching points. He said, I can't get in early every morning. Would you come in half an hour early and when closing time is closing time, wait for half an hour to every man's off the premises. I'll give you the keys and I will pay for you the time that you had for coming in and going home, but I won't pay you any overtime. If you work overtime, I'll keep the same rate. He used to give one of the guys a, a, a little slip and to take their wages round. He found that I was the highest paid worker in the factory because I was up front. I was transparent. I was true to reading the word of God. It works. Now I'm going to tell you something about my university days. When I took the first degree in London, we were given notice that on the New Testament paper, there was going to appear a question that was compulsory of some translation from anywhere in the New Testament. I looked at this with some trepidation because I hadn't read the complete New Testament in Greek. And I thought, if they ask me a question from a passage I haven't read before, I am not going to pass. 
And the rules were, if you failed in one examination, you were not allowed to retake it, you had to take the whole lot again. In the week beforehand, I love to go into bookshops, especially second-hand books. And I spotted a New Testament that was interlinear, Greek on one line and the English on the other. So I took this out. Remember, I was with my, some of my fellow students. Just before the examination for the New Testament, with the unknown translation. I said, Lord, I really am concerned about this. And I opened the book, and I was confronted with James chapter 4. So I read it, the first ten verses. My fellow students were laughing. Chris is really up the old street today. Ah, oh, look at me. He's, he thinks he's going to choose the reading we're going to have on the paper. They felt very relaxed going in. The paper was uh, flat on the, the desk, so you only saw a clean sheet. I put everything away. The only thing that was visible was the paper, my pen, and a bottle of ink to refill my pen. And we turned the paper over on instruction, and there and behold was chapter 4 and verses 1 to 10 staring me in the face. I have a reasonably good memory, and I still see it today. It took me probably two and a half minutes to write down the translation because it was visually impressed upon my mind. God moves in mysterious ways his wonders to perform. And you never know that when you read the word how relevant it might be in the future or in the actual present time. Man shall not live by bread alone. In this case, I had done all my studies for the New Testament examination except there were large chunks of New Testament I hadn't read in the original language. I passed. And my friends, give them their due, I never told them. I never told them. I kept it to myself. I wonder whether I should have told them. But believe me, when you are up against it in a difficulty, the Lord will give you the word that you need, when you need it, and in the way you need it. You feel the undergoing trial and temptation? We, we've all been there. All things work together for good to those who love God were called according to his purpose. Have I had an easy life? No, there have been times when it's been very, very difficult. And some of the difficult times I have a trouble when I remember them because they're so painful. watching my first boy die in his mother's arms, seeing a wife that I'd been married to for 34 years, having a seizure in the brain, and seeing her pass away, but with a smile on her face, and feeling very, very lonely. These are the times when God comes close not that he spares you the pain or the tears. You need to go that. That's natural and it's human and it's right. But he does bring you comfort. And the comfort for me after six, seven months was somebody, well, actually a lot of people came to give, give me words of prophecy. The smallest package on the table wrapped in gold is for you. They said, I believe it's a new wife. 
Then a friend came to say, stay with me. Chris, Jean was your best wife then. And if the Lord gives you another wife, she'll be the best wife for you now. And she's sitting over here. And when I first thaw, saw her, my first thought was, she's too small. Now, how many of you like history? How many of you like poetry? Not so many. Let me tell you about some people famous. And Right. Who's ever heard of Alfred Noyes? No? Let me read you a, a line. The wind was a torrent of darkness amongst the gusty trees. The moon was a ghostly galleon tossed upon cloudy seas. The road was a ribbon of moonlight over the purple moor. And the highwayman came riding, riding, riding. The high men came riding, riding up to the old inn door. You know nothing at all about Alfred Noyes, do you? No. What about Henry Newbolt? I'll read the first verse. There's a breathless hush in the close tonight, ten to make and the match to win, a bumping pitch and a blinding light, an hour to play and the last man in. It's not for the sake of a ribbon coat or the selfish hope of a season's fame, but his captain's hand on his shoulder smote, play up, play up, and play the game. Never heard of him? Some may have. Their poems linger on, but you do not know the men or the history they had. These were local lads. Newbolt was born in Bilston, and Alfred Noyes in Tipton. They were born in about the 1880s, at the end of the reign of Queen Victoria. Both were local lads, both went to the grammar school, both went to Oxford, both became barristers. One went on a tour to America. They liked him so much they made him a professor of one of their top universities in English and poetry. Newbold became a barrister and became an advisor to many important people in governmental circles. Now I'm going to tell you something. God's interested in history. He's interested in you because he has invested his life in you and the only history that's going to be worthwhile at the end of the time is the history of the church. Saint Augustine heard a voice. His mother had prayed for him for 30 years. He was rich and he was unruly. He was immoral and he was spoiled. But Monica, her name, prayed for him for 30 years, and one day in the garden, he heard a voice, take, take up the book and read. In Latin, of course. And it stopped him in his tracks, and he went and got a Bible. And he began to read it. He was convicted of his sin. He was converted. He had a change of life. And he became a bishop. And because of his natural academic ability, he became a theologian. And a famous one. Some of his theology is still believed, but actually I think he should be remembered for what the Lord did in his heart towards people. Because he felt led to go and visit prisons and take them food. 
See, when you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, some of your faith has to be converted into action of how you love one another. And he took pity on the prisoners and began to evangelize the prisoners. And then he looked around and saw so many people without homes. And he went around to all the rich people in his congregation as a bishop and said, I want you to club together and give money so we can buy and make almshouses for the poor so they have some decent home to live in. We remember him as a theologian, but we don't remember what he did in a practical way because he took up the book and he read because his mother prayed for him. And you say, well, how come you know this sort of history about Alfred Noyes? Well, see, I liked history too. So I made church history one of my special subjects and one of the finds of the Oxford. And my tutor came to me and said, you should be doing Reformation church history. I said, uh-uh, I'm staying with this. He said, what do you want, an education or a degree? I said, I need, I want both. I was right to do so. My choice. Because when finals came, my first wife had a massive breakdown. And I was off from college for a long time and I came back for finals, hardly knowing whether I was going to pass or not. But I believe that what you sow, you will reap. And I have a, I have a, a desire that you should take some time to read the scriptures. Now, I'm going to share with you very quickly what, how I do it. I read the passage and then I think it through. You see, the Lord gave us a brain. Think about what I read, and if I have good thoughts, I write it down and I try and pray it in. Read it through, think it over, write it down, pray it in, and then live it out. That's my appeal this morning. I want to encourage you to do that. I have appointed you that you might bear fruit. Because in your time of need, the only history the Lord will ever look at is his story in your life. And collectively, we are the church. So church, his story, is the greatest history in the world that God will take note of. History of poets won't last a minute unless... It's a poet that belongs to God. And if you love poetry, you've got so many psalms and wonderful passages that one of the best known and loved is Psalm 23, isn't it? I was very privileged to have a music teacher. I was 20. I now could afford lessons. I abandoned my lessons at the age of 10 because my parents couldn't afford me to have them. But I kept on playing during those years. And one day she started talking to me. I said, when you finish being a chemist, what are you going to do? I said, I'm going in the ministry. She started giving me voice lessons. And then she began sharing her heart. She was a very large lady with a very bad heart. She said, sometimes in the middle of the night I have these terrible chest pains said, I turned to the Lord and I talked to myself, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He leads me beside still waters and beside green pastures. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. See, in the moments of terror on her own in the night when she has the chest pains, she turned to the word of God that gave her 
peace of heart and mind. If we don't take in food, how can we bear fruit? Because every fruit tree that I've ever known needs some feeding from time to time. If you don't feed a fruit tree and just keep watering it, the fruit gets smaller and smaller. So we give it food. Man shall not eat bread alone, but live by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. I hope I've encouraged you. Do find some time. And if you can think about what you read and write down your own thoughts, it will be a good exercise. Amen.